Hi, I'm Sandy Peterson, and we're going to talk about the maps so that you guys can make intelligent decisions about which maps you need or don't need or which ones fit your playstyle. So the first map we're going to talk about is the primeval map. So here we are at the primeval map. Now, if this map looks a little bit seedy, it's actually because we had a flood in our house. Uh, here in Texas when the map was on the floor. We've mostly restored it, and it but, uh, but I'm just letting you know that it can survive being flooded, but it doesn't look quite as good. So it still looks pretty good though, so let's talk about what we got here. <clears throat> so on the primeval map, <clears throat> the first thing we've done is the oceans are named after actual prehistoric oceans. The Tethys Ocean, the Mescalera Ocean, the, the Morovio, these are all real oceans from the, from, um, millions of years ago but the land masses are all are not are all based on like the uh, like the the mythic land masses so we have Lemuria Thule Atlantis Mu and so forth so the land masses are are Shasta so they're based on like the spiritual ancient things so I thought that would be a fun combination now here's some of the features of this map so first off if you look at it you'll see that if you analyze it, it's a lot harder to move around on than the Earth map. The distances are are shorter. So, for example, like on the on the Earth map, if you start here when in your starting location as um, crawling chaos, and you can move two spaces, you can hit almost everywhere on the map. But here, you can't. You know, I mean, you can. You, it's it's harder to get to spots. Uh, the, the map is more constrained, moving is harder, and that's part of the desired effect. Now the other thing that's obvious is we have glaciers. Now well, the way they work is, the first turn of the game, everyone sets up your gates on your starting areas, just like a regular game. Then, on the first doom phase, everyone's starting area gets a glacier put in it. for example, okay? Now the glacier sits on top of the gate, if there's a gate there, and that gate becomes abandoned. You can't have a cultus on a gate with a glacier. Then the next doom phase, two more spaces with glaciers get glaciers, chosen by the first player. So you might pick this, and you might pick this. He's, he's probably gonna pick places that are areas that you control because he's a jerk, but next doom phase, this and this, the next, these two, and the final doom phase, we have one left and it would go here. And that's how it would work. So what happens is the glaciers move in and they start filling up gates and taking away people's potential doom points. So what happens is that here we are, here's a five player game with all the glaciers placed. Um, and what you have is, instead of the normal 21 areas to play on, there's only 10 that are available for uh, building gates, so you're constrained in this smaller area. But here's the important thing to remember, this map is not a low um, power map because you have fewer gates. It's a high power map because all the baits, bait gates occupied by the glaciers are abandoned. They give everyone a power. So let me give you an example. Let's say it's the first turn of the game, everyone builds a starting gate, well, you can start with a gate, and then the next doom phase, they're all filled in, and you have to move away and build new gates, right? Well, everyone also just got a huge power boost, because let's say that your first turn, um, you, build a, you, you build one gate, that's pretty typical. So you go into the second turn in the gather phase, you have six cultists and two gates for 10 power. Then, um, the next turn, you have a gate or two, and you have five extra power from the abandoned gates. And the next turn is like seven extra power from being however many get it. And so everyone's getting this giant power boost every turn. It's very rare to need to get um, use the minimum power rule on this gate. Everyone has a big amount of power. But here's the other feature. You have a lot of power because of the abandoned gates, but you also don't have very much area to fight over. So the fighting becomes really intense over the areas that are left. There's a there's 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 combats and capturing and, and Shubnigger as avataring and and everyone's doing all these terrible things because you have to get these few areas. The other feature of this map that I find very interesting is that it almost never ends by reaching 30 doom points. Instead, it ends because the because everyone is doing lots of uh, uh, rituals of annihilation. Okay, and so it ends because you get to the. I would say that 
80% of the time this game ends through rituals of annihilation. Typically, it takes about the same length of time to end, but you're doing that instead because because of the of the paucity of gates, elder signs are proportionally much more important for victory. So typical games end with people having like 20, 25 points, and most of it's elder signs and you're fighting over the area, and it's really intense. So if you like Cthulhu War distilled down to a highly aggressive essence, when I say it's intense, it's not just combat, it's all the different abilities people have. Yellow sign and black goat, although they're not combat, are not at a disadvantage in this gate because they have other things that are really nasty they can pull off. So the game is full of uh, of this stuff, and it's really high powered, and that's how it goes. Now, one more thing: you may notice that we have 13 of these uh, of these glaciers, not 12. But there's only 12 areas, 12 areas of glaciers. Well, the reason is because every starting area gets a glacier. So if you're playing with opener of the way, he can start anywhere in the map. So he starts somewhere without a glacier, he still gets a glacier on his turn, and so that's why that is. Um, some people have asked what will happen on the six to eight player map, are there enough glaciers for it? The answer is yes, there's enough glaciers for it. Because the six to eight player map still has only 12 glacier locations, but when you go up in number, it doesn't increase by as many areas as a normal six to eight player map. So you're still highly constrained and intense in the raining areas, and that's how that operates. So that's how the primeval map is. Let's go on to dreamlands. Hey, here's Sandy Peterson again, and we're gonna talk about the Dreamlands map. Now the Dreamlands map has a lot of interesting features. The first is that these two map boards are not adjacent like on the regular Earth map or any of the other maps for that matter. Instead, they're separate levels of the same world so that this map is actually above this one, theoretically speaking, okay? Um, which means that the maps have corners. Like if you're here in the Sea of Dawn, you can't move off this way and come in on the other side. So it's, it's, uh, there's not, there's, there's like pockets you can hide in the corner on the map, unlike any other, unlike other maps. So that's kind of a, a uh, interesting feature. The other is that of course you still have to have a way to transport between this map and this map, and you've got it in the form of tunnels. There are these black things that look like, like trapdoor spider holes or something, and they have a letter on that shows what they connect to. So the Enchanted Woods has the C tunnel that connects to the Tower of Koth. Zura has the A tunnel that connects to the ruins of Karoth. So you can move from the Zura to the ruins of, uh, of Karoth and back again, and that's, that's how it works, right? So the other feature that's interesting is that there are these uh, citadels, you see, on the maps. Now, the way the citadels work is that if you control a gate in the area with a citadel, you're considered to control that citadel, okay? And if you manage to control all four citadels on a map at the same time, you immediately win. Even if you don't have six spell books, no matter what your doom points are, that's an instant win. So obviously you're like, typically in each game, at least one person, maybe two are trying to get the citadels for a win. And, and the guys who are getting the citadels, they're never doing original annihilation because that uses a power they could use to get a citadel. Well, you may ask, why doesn't everyone go after citadels? Well, the reason everyone doesn't go after citadels is because there are monsters on the map that interfere with capturing the citadels, plus of course the enemy players. So in the underworld we have the bowl who appears in the Sea of Nath, Feel of Nath. And you notice the citadels have a red number on them, okay? That's a die roll. So you roll that, so the bowl, you roll that die roll and the and the bowl rolls to the to the number that, so let's say you rolled a two for the, your number, the dole would move here. If there's a gate there, the dole then destroys the gate and any unit on the gate. So the dole is is bad, okay? Now, if there's already a gate in the area the dole is, he doesn't roll a die to move, he just stays there and eats that gate. So uh, you can pin him down by building a gate, but it, it's not very popular because it costs you three power and then the dole eats it. So the dole is when it is terrifying, he's going to try to eat guys. And one question people have is, well, can he eat Yogg-Sothoth? Because Yogg-Sothoth's the gate. And the answer is yes, he can eat Yogg-Sothoth and we've seen him do it. Um, now the advantage of Yogg-Sothoth on this map is that you, since he's a gate, you can go to an area, just move him to an area, and all at once you have that citadel, okay? If there's an enemy gate there too, then you both control that citadel, and if either of you get the three others, you'll win. But the risk for Yogg-Sothoth is that this guy's here, and he can kill you, 
and it's that's like not very fun. So on the surface world, there's no bowl. Instead, you have the zoogs. And what you do with the zoogs, the first doom phase, you roll one die for each zoog. So let's say you roll one, two, three, four, five, six. You'd have two here, one here, one here, and two here. That's usually not what you roll though. Okay. Then as you then. Any area with a zoog, they play pranks on your cultists and annoy them. And what happens is you can't control the gate. You're bumped off it while the zoog is there. Now you can fight the zoogs. They have combat zero. Any kill kills them and they can't retreat. If you get a retreat result, they're taken off the board. Okay? They're, they're considered to have hidden to the underbrush. But if you get a retreat on them, then they also make one of your guys retreat as they play one final prank. So, um... So it's better to kill them if you can, but they can also push your guys out of the area. Now, if you kill, let's say you kill two of them, right? Two, these two are killed. Okay, next doom phase, you roll the d6s. Let's say you roll like a five and a six. Well, the two goals reappear, they both be here now, the two zoogs. Now this area has four zoogs, it's really hard to capture. So the zoogs keep respawning and, and haunting the gates and you gotta get rid of them to capture the gates. Plus you gotta fight the enemies. And so our experience is that um, that uh, in a typical game, like a five player game, the, a guy going for the gates wins about 20% of the time, which is about the same as anyone else wins, but he's using a different path to win, which makes the game a lot more interesting. And uh, of course, then there's the fun of it. The Zoogs have other features. For example, um, Yogg-Sothoth can safely combat them because they have zero combat and promote his guys. Cthulhu can get his spell books by devouring him, you know, in his combat, right? But, uh, but then they also retreat the guys out there. They are an interesting feature of the game. Uh, um, so we got, this, we got the Zoogs, we got the Bull, we have penalties for building the gates, we have the extra victory condition, and we have the Tuttles. All this adds together to be a very exciting dynamic map with lots of considerations you have to make all the time. And, uh, and uh, it has an interesting strategic choices because you have to decide early on if you want to go for a Citadel win or a conventional win. And if you want to go for a conventional win, you want to stay away from the Citadels. But if you want to go for, because the, the zoogs or bulls go there, but if you want to go for for a, a uh, citadel win, then you got to focus on them. So it's a very different kind of lifestyle, and uh, that's the fun of the Dreamlands map. Next up is the Yagoth map. All right, now we're going to talk about the Yagoth map, Pluto, which I guess is not a planet, but whatever it is, it's Yagoth. So let's talk about Yagoth. Well, the first thing I want to discuss is that the layout of this is radically different from other maps in that most maps have like oceans covering most of the map with islands of, of land. But the Yagoth map has the oceans are craters because it's like an alien planet. And so like there's all like oceans aren't adjacent to other oceans. They're separate, they're separate little areas, which poses an interesting, uh, um, not a puzzle, but like the way you play is quite different because suddenly um, Yellow Sign doesn't have to cross the empty oceans in order to go get his spell books. Cthulhu has to plan differently how he's going to move around. There's uh, there, uh, which is by the way, is why so many of the uh, starting areas are in the ocean. So Cthulhu won't have a problem building. This, like other guys will often build gates for him and helps him get a spell book. But uh, but the but the cratered oceans really make the game feel different when you're moving around. Let alone the other features of this map, which now you're going to go into. So. The, 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 most, the most obvious feature of this map is that it has a laboratory. Do, do, do. In the laboratory, whoever controls the gate on the laboratory, which could be Oxidoth if he's there, can do the surge reaction. This costs one power and turns as many cultists as you want, well, up to four, into brain cylinders. There's the brain cylinders. These are the purple ones, so these would be Oxithos, or the opener of the ways brain cylinders. There's 28 brain cylinders in the pack, so you have four for each faction. Now, uh, your cultists go off the board. Now, the way a brain cylinder works, it's got a combat of zero, like your other cultists. It has, now, it can't move on its own, okay? It can control gates, it generates power, but to move a, a brain cylinder, you have to, um, <clears throat> move it with another unit of yours. Now it moves for free then. So if you had like, say you had your four brain cylinders in the area and you moved, Yoxathoth moved a mutant from here to the radiation waste. Well, all four brain cylinders could go along with you if you wanted, or you could leave one behind, it's up to you. So they're, they're cheap to move. Um, the other thing is they can't be pained. So if you're ever in a combat and uh, the other guys are pained out, you can't target pains on brain cylinders. 
so they tend to be left behind after a battle. And the other feature is, when you capture a brain cylinder, say that, uh, for example, Yox, uh, uh, Black Goat captured one of these cylinders. Well, you can either capture it normally and, and sacrifice it, or you can simply replace it with your own brain cylinder. And then you have a new cultist on the map. So even if only one guy has the lab, other people tend to be captured. They're easy to capture because they get they don't get pain, so they stay behind where your units are if you want to fight. And then they start to get captured and, and join your side. And then you have these extra units. And of course you can re-summon your cultists you, you did surgery on. So you can you can potentially have ten cultists on this map. It, it's hard to do, but it's possible. So uh, so that's the fun of that. Now um, you may ask, well, what about the chochos? Do you have a chocho things in this? And the answer is we don't have chocho brain cylinders in the Yugoth map, but if you buy the chocho expansion, it comes with four chocho brain cylinders. So they can be, they can be cylinderized just like anyone else. Um, another interesting thing we've done here is we have, though I don't see it, we have provided a laboratory token for the players that you can use to put on other maps to have a laboratory if you want. If you want to try the, the surgery option on other maps, it's not official rules, it's just we had space on the counter sheet and we said, hey, let's give the players a break. We did that. Okay, the next feature I'm gonna talk about is the slime sea and the slime sea overlook. Okay, now if you look here, there's an image of us. Here's the slimes, jolly little guys. Here's the little slimes, okay? There's six of them. Now, <clears throat> see the slimes have a little picture of a slime in the areas, that's where they're summoned. Okay, but there's also the universal no slimes image here. No slimes can move to the slime sea overlook. Now they can be retreated there or carried there by movement like abilities like submerge or whatever, but they can't move there on their own. Now how the slimes work, if you control a gate on the slime sea, and this time if, if there's, if Yoxodoth is there with another gate, then the, the real, the real gate controls the slime sea overlook, not Yoxodoth. So Yoxodoth's got to kick at the guy, right? So, in slimes, so if you control the slime sea overlook, then you're able to summon slimes. And the way they work is this. They have a combat of two, okay? And if you have no slimes, then the first slime you summon is free, costs you zero. Each other slime costs one. So they're actually a nice, inexpensive, mid-level monster that is a, a benefit to anyone's powers, right? Now they tend to hang around this side of the map because I mean, they're, they're as hard to move as anyone else, even though they're cheap to get. So they, they don't usually make their way very far over, right? And, uh, and since they can't go to the Slime Sea Overlook, you can't pile them up here and defend yourself, which is actually the intent. So there they are. There's often fighting over the Slime Sea, and of course to get there you have to go through the slime ocean, where there's tend to be slimes, and it's all very interesting, and, uh, and that's how that goes. So. Um, also, if you lose your gate in the slime sea, you say that no one has a gate here, it's abandoned, then the slimes become neutral. They just sit there and they don't, they're not anyone's side. You can still attack them if you want, but I'm not sure what you're gonna get out of it. Maybe Cthulhu could do a spell book. Okay, so that's the slimes. <clears throat> and we have also provided a slime marker and a no slime marker for use on other maps if you want to use the slimes elsewhere. And again, we haven't provided rules for it. It's just there for players to do it yourself. Okay. I've held this off for a while because the most awesome thing on the Yagoth map is of course the Watcher of the Green Pyramid. This is an evil great old, well I guess they're all evil, this is an enemy great old one that appears here in the Watcher Postern. Now if you look over here on the uh, Green Pyramid, what you have is, is there's areas here and there's a picture of a gate with a plus one. What this means is that gates built in these areas earn an extra point of power. So if you have a gate on the Pyramid Emerald Slope, then it's worth three power instead of two. So these are like popular places to build gates. But you may also notice that they have a number in a red thing. And that number is a die roll. Every doom phase, you roll a die. If the number is it comes up, if the number that comes up is one of the areas where there is a gate. So for example, it only goes one to four. So if you rolled a five, it would never happen. If, if only gate one, had a, had a gate, only area one had a gate, then a controlled gate, that is, then only a one would activate the watcher. But when the watcher appears, then you take this, this token is normally on the, uh, the, um, the doom uh, counter, the doom uh, track, okay? But when the watcher's awake, 
you flip it over and he's and he's alive and with his eyeball sticking out. Okay, it starts at 12. Okay, and you place the watcher right here. He always appears here in the watcher's posture, and because then, you know, right? Okay, then what happens at the start of the action phase, <laughs> each player in turn, starting with the action player, has one brief semi-action where all they can do is activate the watcher. To activate the watcher, you move them into an adjacent area containing units. Now, if there's no adjacent area containing units, you can teleport anywhere on the map, but normally there's someone there. For one thing, someone just like built a gate there so we can go to where the gate is. Okay, then the watcher does an attack. He rolls 12 dice, because this starts at 12. Then the enemy fights back. Every kill you inflict on the watcher lowers the watcher's total by one. The watcher is immune to retreats or retreat-like things. So like, for example, um, uh, the, the, the Wendigos can't make him retreat with their special ability, okay? Uh, you can't make him, like, uh, Necrophagy doesn't get him out of the area, he just can't retreat, okay? So each guy gets to move him once, and of course what happens is usually one guy's in the lead, so he moves to pick on an enemy, then the other three guys all go pick on him three times in a row. And the Watcher, each Doom phase after the first, the Watcher counter also decays by a d6, so he tends to run out of oomph and go away. Once he's gone though, you start rolling the die again, so he could come back a second time if you killed him really fast. Usually though, it's one big cruise along the map. When he comes on, he's really obnoxious, he's killing units, he's, he's painting them, he's just, it's like, it's a, it's, a real, it's a real nightmare. So that's the fun though, because the Watcher really, for while the Watcher's in play, he's a major factor in everyone's uh, considerations, which I like. So this map has three, like, related alien things that, that, that all give you special cool abilities that are, that are worth fighting over, but of course the problem with them is that they're like, they're disadvantaged associated with them all, other guys want to focus on them. And so the map is, has, uh, has is, it's more tactical in a sense than the Dreamlands. You're not making the, a big strategic decision. My strategic decision is I want to control the pyramid because you can't because the Watcher comes drive you off. But you technically say, I'm going to get the pyramid for two turns, then I'm going to run away before the Watcher comes. Except, of course, you always spend one turn too long and he gets you, right? But, but, um, but it's all about tactical tactics, moving around, taking advantage of, of, of current events. Is hey, there's no there's no slimes in the South Slime Sea right now. I'm gonna try to get through there to get you know that kind of thing. So it's uh it's very fun, very interesting, weird abilities. You f it feels like an alien world because of all these strange things you don't normally encounter, and that was the intent we wanted. So I hope you have enjoyed um, our discussion of uh, this map. Next, we're gonna talk about the Library of Seleno. Hi, we're going to talk about the library at Seleno. First, I got some caveats. We actually had a nice laminated map that, and then after some playtests, I decided I needed to change the map. So we now have like the final version of the map, but because I couldn't, I mean, I did it on poster board and and the new map is, you know, in the process of being made and it will look nice and it has like bookshelves in it and non-Euclidean geometry, but for this show, I don't have that one. I have the poster board that I made with felt tip pen. So <laughs> please bear with us <laughs> and uh, you'll be seeing a better map at, uh, at some point. So now we're gonna look at this map. Okay, so this map, kind of like the Dreamlands map, has an upper floor that's this and the lower, in fact, I should put the upper floor above it, so we'll do it that way. Upper floor and a lower floor, okay? Just like Dreamlands. And it has corners like Dreamlands because it's one building. I mean, it's a giant building, probably miles across, right? Maybe hundreds of miles. Well, kilometers for our European friends, but you get the idea. So, on this map, there's a number of interesting things. First off is movement, of course, than usual. Now, one of the movement features is kind of like the tunnels on Dreamlands, and they're stairways. And they're labeled, they have different colors and they have a number. So like, for example, here is stairway B. It leads from the Oubliette to the Gloom Loft. Here's stairway C. It goes from the Red Hall to the Hororium. So the, 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 the stairwells just go straight up and down. Unlike the stairwells in um, the Dreamlands, with those are tunnels that go all which way, the idea behind these is they're actually geometrically similar to where the actual stairway is, because it's, although the building has non Euclidean features, it's not completely uh, 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 weird that way. Now the next feature of, the, of this thing is that there are doors to the outside, these archways, right here they look like little 
like square back cannons, but they're not gonna look like, they're gonna be cool archways, right? And the archways go outside. Now, no one wants to be outside on Salerno because it like, it sucks. So what happens is, if you go through an archway, you can instantly teleport or run around to any other area with an archway. So you can move directly from here to here and nothing, and you're not stopped. Or from here to here. And you can, and that's, a, that's another way of movement. So you have the stairs and you have the archways. Now, you, some questions you may have is, first off, is what about oceans for Cthulhu? And so, well, we have them. See, the basement is flooded. And then there's a fountain here and an overlook of the Lake of Holly. So there's water. That's what the blue things are here. So there is oceans, well, oceans on the map that Cthulhu can use. Remember, hundreds of miles across, right? Big, big library. All right, so <clears throat> um, the next thing is, of course, is that we have books you can check out. So here are the four special collection rooms all on the upper floor. We have the the ear, the ear and the unger. We have the barrier of Notchtith. We have the larvae of the outer gods, and we have the guardian under the lake. And each of these have a special book associated with them. Now, if you control the gate in this room, you get that special book. It's not one of your spell books. It's put next to your faction card, and you control that book. And all of these books are really powerful. They're way better than a regular spell book, okay? So they give you a real edge. Now, the other thing that happens in this map is everyone gets a silence token that you can then spend to activate the librarian or the custodian. Now here's the stand-ins I'm gonna use for them. This is not what the real librarian or custodian look like, but they're kind of like this. Here's the librarian, here's the custodian. So the custodian, what he does is uh, you teleport into any room and then you roll the agony die, which is a score of one to four. That many units in the, it cleans up the area. That many units in the area must go to the oubliette. So the oubliette is where he sends all the troublemakers and all the things. So so the, so as, as people are moving the, the um, uh, custodian around, their, their units tend to accumulate in the oubliette and get, and get shoved there. And of course, a really common place for him to go is to one of the, uh, one of the libraries to send, so you can use, lose your guys in the in the book room and go to the and then of course you've lost you've lost your date there. Well, you still keep the book; it just becomes overdue, and you can still keep using the ability. And of course, you want to because they're great abilities. But th this is where the librarian comes into play, and the librarian is also activated by silence tokens, but he can only go after a person who has an overdue book. Okay, now uh, these units, so the librarian, these units work a little, the silence tokens work a little bit like controlling the Watcher on Yagoth, except with the Watcher, everyone controlled him once in a row at the very start of the turn. With the librarian and the custodian, each person can activate one of them once, but it can be any time during the turn because it's whenever you spend your silence token. And since you can't accumulate silence tokens and they cost zero to use, you, you never want to finish your turn without having to use your silence token. So they're always, everyone's using them. Now what, the, what he does, he goes to the area where you have, where, the, where the, the, the cheater has, the guy that's not returning his book, and he rolls the agony die too. But his agony die doesn't say the oubliette. It can it can kill units, it can cost doom points, or it can um, force you to return the book. Your choice. So in this map you have an interesting uh, ma a map with areas kind of awkward to get to because there's so many little rooms, but you do have movement abilities with the with stairwells and the archways that let you zip all over the place. And then you have these monsters going around causing trouble and doing things. And then you have these awesome new spell books that are, are are world changing that get stolen away from you because you've lost your, um, you, they go over to and the librarian comes after you. So there's a lot of decisions to make. There's which rooms you want to go to. I know one player that likes to not get the books, which I think kind of handicaps him, but he, at least he's safe from the librarian. So that's how this works with silence tokens and custodians and the librarian and the new books that do, of, do various things. I think you will enjoy it. We've really liked it and uh, we'll be uh, seeing you on the tabletop.